This guy is very hard to hug. You end up, you know, somewhere in the middle. <laughs> but you do want to. All right, so continuing in my grand tradition of not uh, talking about what I'm supposed to talk about, I think the agenda said that I'm talking about in, uh, the, the future. Maybe, probably not, however. It's at the end, and uh, if we get there, we get there. We'll see how many people head for the exit before we get there. What I wanted to talk about, if I can bring this screen up. Uh, yeah, let's slow down. Let me shut it. Hank, shut it all down. Look at this. He's trying to sabotage me right from the beginning. There it is. Um, I wanted to talk about was this idea of ecology and urbanism. Um, and I've been reading all the conversations that have been going on, and it's very exciting to have involved in this stuff for so long. But I just want to make sure it recognizes where we stand vis-a-vis -vis sustainability. Sustainability is not an add-on to urbanism. Urbanism is not an add-on to sustainability. These are not little green knobs, as the prince said so perfectly, that we can overlay, augment. The reality is, urban is sustainability. There is no sustainability without urbanism. It's absurd to think about it. We are the foundation, is the foundation of a sustainable future. And I believe much of what, what is in the charter already defines the domain very, very adequate of our goals and strategies. And so, uh, I think it's important that we communicate on that level, uh, that we're not a group that's uh, in some way playing catch up or joining the crowd on sustainability. We're actually the group that has been saying for a very long time, you have to approach this in a holistic way. You know, I started the sustainability stuff in the 70s, and Sim Vander and I wrote a book on sustainability called The Sustain. Uh, 1980. Um, and what was interesting about that period was it was all driven by, a, you know, one dimension. Everybody was excited about the oil, the, the oil embargo and the notion that we were going to run out of oil or that somehow we had to cope with that. We thought that was a great uh, mechanism to uh, advance the cause that we saw had much larger purpose. But the whole thing deflated very rapidly after the 70s because it, it became a single issue movement. It became about saving energy. And as much as we all emphatically believe now that carbon is playing that same role, I think it's very dangerous for urbanists to become single issue proponents. Um, we become in some way carbon engineers, which is really not what we're about, because we're not engineers, we're designers. And urbanism is about always um, conflating and seeing the synergy between all the different dimensions of human existence, economic, social, and environmental. And I think everybody in the CNU understands this inherently. Now that all said, it does to drill down and understand the substance of some of the challenges in front of us. Just like we drill down with the traffic engineers and get to the substance of how they do their calculations so we can turn that on its head. We need to do the same thing with the uh, carbon engineers that are out there trying to see the world in one dimension once again. Uh, ecology and urbanism, there are these three, uh, you know, just you have to make clear, three primary components. When you're designing projects, there's community infrastructure, which only exists at the scale of larger communities. Interestingly enough, typically at the neighborhood or district level, in many cases at the city level. And you can't take that out of the equation, because if you can achieve efficiencies at the community infrastructure scale, you may not have to achieve it at the building scale. Or there may be a complementary balancing between the two, and I'll, I'll get into that in some more. Transportation efficiency is the second leg of this, and it's the biggest, it, it, one of the biggest ones, but it's not the only one. But transit-oriented development is clearly, and walkability and getting away from the automobile is a big part of it. That's directly linked to urbanism. Finally, building design, where a lot of attention lead, and all these guys are, you know, most attention now is in how to reskin buildings and what kind of uh, mechanisms you can put into buildings. That's fine. That's good. That's very important in most climate zones. Uh, but it can't overshadow balancing between all three of these. So let me go all the way uh, 
And, and this graph, which I show a lot now, it really shows the, some of the relationships in terms of energy and carbon. A typical suburban house compared to a, a suburban greenhouse. Now, you could even do better. You could say, we're going to reduce the en household energy consumption, which is the yellow part of this, dramatically through uh, co conservation, solar, insulation. You still are not as good as a typical unadorned urban um, dwelling unit on average in the United States. So you can't even get there in suburbia, no matter what kind of bells and whistles you place around the buildings and what kind of drainage system you put between them. And then, of course, the, the ideal the thing that we're all headed towards is the urban green strategy. You know, this is a, an old graph that I've used for years and years. It just shows among developed countries, the huge range in automobile use and how much opportunity, low-hanging fruit, we have there. And it's clearly only through new urbanism, urbanism, transit-oriented development, that we're going to pick that particular fruit. Um, it's a land use question, but it always has to be coupled to, of course, the right kind of infrastructure investments. Um, you'll note, I always love to note over here, that in Sweden, where it's cold and they're rich, they walk more than they drive uh, by a long shot. It's also interesting to note in this graph, it's very telling, that transit is never, never exceeds walking. Transit is nothing but uh, an enhancer of the walk, walkable environment. So you always have to start with the walkable environment when you're thinking about alternatives to the automobile. I'm going to go all the way back to the 70s because I want to revisit a little bit of what happened in those days. And it's it's really quite extraordinary as I look back. There was a, a plan, Jerry Brown became governor and he was very, and he still is, and he's now leading the charge for a lot of the carbon uh, 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 cap uh, legislation that's going on in California. Um, there was a, uh, a master plan for downtown Sacramento, which was very telling. It was a Reagan plan. Ronald Reagan was governor before. These are all political metaphors that play out in deep reality of urbanism. And this was a, a tower in the park uh, strategy. Tear down the center of the city, the Capitol building you can see along the top, and uh, build a series of office high rise. Um, Jerry hired Sim Vanderen, and I got to tag along with Sim. Um, and Sim said, well, the first thing we got to do is replan this. And his idea was basically what we all now call new urbanism. Maintain the historic city grid develop a mix of employment, retail, and office, uh, high density, low rise, walkable, add transit, um, and respect the historic traditions of the city. So from the towers in the park to the walkable street, mixed use environment, it was laid out here literally 30 years ago. And what happened was kind of extraordinary. This was one of those uh, break points for cities, instead of emptying out Sacramento along with Portland and San Diego, who all kind of joined together in the 70s to, to actually activate a kind of urbanism that we're still following on with, this idea of making the city for people again, um, it led to some interesting things. The transit brought with it, in all three of those cities, interestingly enough, regional retail. For the first time, the major shopping, regional shopping, came back to the city center. In, uh, and they were all called the plaza, which is kind of uh, telling. Um, the Horton Plaza in San Diego and um, the plaza, just they couldn't think of more <laughs> in Sacramento. Infill, co-housing, uh, mixed-use housing over uh, shops and cafes. Historic restoration of both old Victorians and a tradition of uh, kind of uh, modern buildings. And a whole series of state office buildings that really pushed the limits in energy conservation. This is the Basin Building, one of 12 buildings built around the state in that period um, that literally uh, pushed the envelope on energy conservation. This building used a big atrium that had uh, louvers to allow sun in for heat in the winter, cool and shaded in the summer. More significantly, the, the concrete structure was used as a big thermal ballast so that the cool night air could pre-cool the building and let it flywheel through the rest of the day. 
The west facades had active shades. The south facades had overhangs. The whole building had clear glass and was naturally daylit. And lighting, the light switching system uh, accommodated and recognized the daylight that was coming into the building. So a lot of the strategies we're now beginning to understand were there. This is the atrium. It was amazing getting through the, this through the state legislature because they said, well, why should we pay for this? And we were able to justify it as an energy device. The, 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 the energy conservation of this space was what we used to uh, rationalize the cost of building, once again, a traditional courtyard building with street walls um, and interiors thermally uh, modified. This is the, uh, the, the west facade uh, with its curtains coming down. And the difference was extraordinary. It was almost a five to one. The towers in the rear were built in the, in the 60s. They consumed around 126,000 BTUs of square foot per year. And the basin building, named after the famous anthropologist, um, uh, a, a fifth of that. Now, one of the other less known things that happened in Sacramento, and this is also SIM, if you see this flow chart at the top, this goes, this goes to, so what do we have here in Sacramento? We have a new transit system. We have a walkable neighborhood. So we have the transit component. We have energy efficient buildings like nobody had ever seen. And then we had this community scale system. And this is the diagram that Sim drew. There was a beetle infestation up in the Sierra Mountains that were killing a, a lot of the fir trees and there was biomass. So he said, why don't we bring it down, put it into a gasifier, put that into a cogeneration plant, which you see actually constructed below here. Cogen, if some of you don't understand it, can, by, by capturing the waste heat that is always present when you generate electricity, no matter what source, whether it's oil, gas, coal, or biomass, uh, um, the waste heat is thrown away in most, uh, most big centralized remote plants. If you can recapture that heat, and pipe it around, as they do in many university campuses, you can effectively double the efficiency of that generating capacity, of that plant. You basically double the, 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 um, the kilowatts, hours uh, created from any, any energy source. And of course, doubling efficiency is like cutting a demand in half. So this is a huge move. It turns out, for us new, urbanism, or, or new urbanists, that district heating and cooling systems run about a quarter mile before the pipes start to become too inefficient. So lo and behold, our little increment of development not only works for the pedestrian, it also works for what is probably the most efficient form of energy and heating and cooling strategy that we could put in place. So my attitude is cogeneration before you ever think about solar or anything else. I mean, just day one. Um, and it's not flashy, it's not exciting. But it was there, it was built, and then Sim had this idea that you get the, the electricity and the hot water for heat and you can run um, uh, 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 absorption cycle chillers. You come out of this wood chip gasifier, you also get methane, which you can pump into the houses for, for um, um, cooking. And then the liquid waste can go into aqua farms and irrigation. Uh, and the solid waste go into land, landfill composters. This is 30 years ago. So the light rail went in. It's expanding now. It is the framework of a, of a regional plan for Sacramento, which is going forward in a robust way. As a matter of fact, the very first transit-oriented development design codes, uh, I had the opportunity to do 20 years later. Uh, after that period, it came back, and, um, and that was the beginning of that idea. All right, hold on. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to make any segues in this talk, because uh, that is a big jump from uh, Sacramento in 76 to uh, Dubai in, in 2006. Uh, but here we go. Dubai is like um, city development on beyond steroids. It's a city happening that normally would take 200 years. It's happening in 20 years. And what's fascinating is it's evolving quite rapidly from this hyped up um, model of uh, Las Vegas to what can be a real showcase for sustainability, as ironic as that sounds. But Sheikh Mohammed uh, has now been convinced 
that light rail is the only answer to his uh, city state and that the car see they built they built so fast and so much that they actually achieved congestion levels that normally take about 50 years for a city to get to they're there immediately it took them about five years and there's not complete gridlock the other nice thing and Lee just loves this um, the, you know Sheikh Mohammed is the decider um, in the real sense he said we're going to build some light rail three years ago they have th six light rail lines under construction today, one of which is complete. That was three years ago. Now, this is not a bastion of public process and input. Um, but it is fun to work in this context. Last year, we went to Sheikh Mohammed and started talking about energy issues. And uh, he thinks oil is way too valuable to burn. He'd rather sell it to us because we're really stupid about that. And they're going to engage in every energy conservation strategy they can come up with because oil is too valuable to burn. Um, and so uh, they're building huge solar uh, generating plants, uh, which are incorporated here. He also mandated that every single building in Dubai will be LEED certified. That happened three months ago. So these are pretty radical steps, and it's going to be interesting to watch this laboratory evolve. We got a little project here, um, which is uh, designed for an area pro approximating around 2.7 million in population. Uh, it sits behind, in a, a fairly unbecoming uh, location, behind their new airport and their new um, international freight port. So it's the economic engine, and clearly ports and airports are where a lot of the business goes on. So this is where the real jobs are. Dubai is, in a way, the Hong Kong of the Middle East. It's a safe haven for business to happen. And it doesn't have much oil. Abu Dhabi next door has all the oil. These guys, they don't have oil. They just like to pretend they do. So this is the site. It's around 50,000 acres. And the, the first strategy that was, once again, uh, the, the uh, Sheikh Maktoum came up with was to build a canal. The history of Dubai is that it evolved around a canal they call it the creek. And the Dows and the Abras, water transportation was actually how people got around. If it wasn't on a camel, it was on these little Abras, these little uh, boats. So the idea of building a community that was based on transit, but also based on water transit, uh, and also bringing water into the desert, even the salt water, the microclimate effects and, the, and just the sheer pleasure of it, uh, I think, uh, played multiple roles. And there's a hierarchy to this system, which I, I don't even think I can get into, but I think we all understand it. There are urban centers, um, there are town centers, there are village centers, there's a whole range of green belt systems that work off of the energy systems. I'll get more into that later. This is a, a, a diagram of the transit network, and it's not particularly clear in here, but the red and the blue line, the purple line, and this uh, brown line out here are all uh, uh, countrywide light rail systems, and it is just a city state. Um, and all this stuff out in here are streetcar systems that feed into these urban centers that also are multimodal with the water based transit. So it's a very robust transit network. We did this work uh, in conjunction with lots of people, but uh, one of the prime players was Cordy Gallus, who I've really enjoyed working with lately. This is a diagram of some of the urban centers as the canal comes around, touches in, the ferry boats and the Abra intersect with the transit systems, the high density. And this is also where I'm starting to learn more about high density, high rise. You know, the rest of the world, it's only America that builds three-story cities. I mean, everybody, everywhere else realizes inherently they can't afford it in terms of land and infrastructure. So this is one of the urban centers. And the qualities that can be evolved, that evolve out of bringing the water in, bringing the urbanism in, into play, and setting up relationships. And there's a lot of amazing, gorgeous stuff that we can do with this. And the amazing part, of course, is that they actually get out there and build it right away. Um, and this is the urbanism that we've evolved. And so we are taking this and uh, intersecting um, a very strange new environment. Now. A lot of this looks very extravagant in terms of energy and water, two things that are critical in the desert. Uh, but there's some very interesting uh, strategies that we've evolved here. Many of the streets 
So the microclimate effects are giant here. A lot of people, when I started working there, said you, nobody will ever walk in Dubai. It's hot, humid. It's not hot, dry, like a nice, great desert climate. It's hot, humid. It's about as mean as it gets. Uh, you know, in the summer, 110 degrees with 80% humidity. Try that on for uh, a quarter mile. Um, so a lot of it has to do with the, lo the ambience. And I thought, why not make streets, when you look at the historic architecture, the most comfortable places in much of the Middle East are traditional courtyards that are fully shaded and have water. Think the Alhambra. Um, and that is the kind of space that works. So my attitude was, why not make streets that have the same features? So we have these canal streets where the water comes off the main canal and flows down the streets. And then we wrote a design code that required that every builder, and this is in different developers, uh, to actually uh, cantilever huge shades out over the street in much way as the souks do. And if you walk through any souk in the Middle East, um, there's a hodgepodge of shading and canopies that are thrown up there uh, by each individual segment along the way. So this rendering is inconsistent, is not true because, of course, they're all going to be different and uh, one, one off. You know, working at this scale gave us a great opportunity to really drill into that community scale infrastructure component of the sustainability agenda. And lo and behold, the diagram comes out to be pretty close to what Sim drew 30 years ago for Sacramento. And let me take you through this because I think you all as practitioners need to understand these potential components. Um, there's a water cycle and there's an energy cycle. And they intersect with the, in these three um, kind of uh, infrastructure items, wastewater treatment, district cooling, and drinking water desalination. The, the input to the whole system is natural gas. Uh, this is not a, you know, a city for 2.7 million is not energy free, but it's greatly reduced. Uh, and the, uh, the output is brine. Everything else is internalized within the system. So the energy, natural gas comes in, the gas turbine, which is a cogen system, produces electricity, it produces hot water for district cooling uh, and heating, and it produces um, uh, heat to uh, desalinate the water. So it's a tri-generation system, even more efficient than cogen. Um, the solar thermal, large solar thermal farm is actually going to augment the desalination process for the for the uh, water. Um, the chilled water coming out of the district cooling plant goes to the buildings, as does electricity. Um, from this water cycle over here, you have the, the source of the water for the desalination, which goes into the buildings, uh, which comes back out into the waste treatment plant. God, I got to figure out how to get these arrows to be a little clear. What do you guys think? And this is not right. Um, the wastewater is biological uh, sewage treatment that goes through a series of constructed wetlands into lakes, which are then used for, for on-site irrigation and gray water recycling, and is, are also taken an extra step of treatment to come back into the house, the gray water, and be used for toilet flushing and other, um, uh, and, and also for the district cooling system. Um, the biomass that comes out of this system of lakes, constructed wetlands, and urban agriculture uh, goes into anaerobic digester again, and the biogas comes out and helps with the cooling of the buildings. So this, you know, this is very engineering, but you know, this is also a level of knowledge that we in the Congress need to get to. As I said, just in the same way that we that we took on and began to understand the traffic engineers, so that they couldn't run their mumbo jumbo and say it's not possible. Uh, we need to understand these systems enough so that we can call the civil engineers to task and the sanitary engineers. Notice that they're all professionals and we're not, the urbanists are not a profession. It's kind of astounding to me. Um, but you can, if you treat shit, you're, you're a profession. That's a, um, and you have, a, actually you have a professional organization much bigger than this one. <laughs> I haven't been to any of their conferences yet, but just like we were invited to the ITE, I bet you we're going to end up at those uh, the National Organization of Sanitary Engineers. Who volunteer to go first? 
and me. <laughs> so this is what we were able to achieve in this project. Water, uh, water consumption um, down, uh, you can see the numbers, you know, down. Uh, uh, to, um, but more importantly, the very expensive and energy intensive process of desalinating salt water goes down from seven uh, major plants to two major plants. Um, this is a diagram step from a typical demand and what each piece of the strategies that we employ in this community play out. The zero scaping, uh, low water on landscaping, efficient fixtures, district cooling efficiencies, uh, reduced losses through evaporation because we shade and intelligent reuse, gray water reuse here. Re um, this is a diagram of the, the, the step from a typical demand and what each piece of the strategies that we employ in this community play out. The zero scaping, uh, low water demand on, uh, on landscaping, efficient fixtures, district cooling efficiencies, uh, reduced losses through evaporation because you shade and intelligent reuse, gray water reuse here, reuse in the building, and the re that recycle district. So energy systems and water systems flowing together. Uh, another one of these diagrams. This actually makes it a little sim simpler. This is just a diagram of the water cycle. Uh, sewage treatment goes into the constructed wetlands and lakes. The lakes then feed um, uh, urban agriculture uh, and the, uh, di the, uh, the, the district cooling systems. This is, uh, this is actually, they're, they're, you know, and what's also fascinating about these places is they are already way ahead of us. Three minutes left. Get out. Oh, we have an next group in here? All right, well, we'll get through only one project. Energy demand down uh, dramatically, as you can see. And one of the big things here is gigawatt uh, uh, production. I think I've already explained all this, how the this is just the takeoff on the energy system. This is what's exciting. Each one of these technologies is already today. Cogen plants are more normative in the rest of the world than they are here. Uh, anaerobic digesters are a technology you can it and use it. Um, and all forms of solar collectors, which of course in the Middle East make all the sense in the world. And this is the rich in energy through the whole thing. Um, and you see dramatic changes there. What's fascinating is at this scale, it's actually cheaper to build a sustainable system than a standard system. Large, and these are in thousands of dollars, so that's $1.7 billion of expense for generating capacity. So instead of building seven power plants, we're only building two power plants. And capital savings there, of course, add up and allow us to spend $400 million on uh, solar collect, uh, a, a, big, a giant solar farm. Here's a couple other projects. In Karachi, I'll just skip through this one. It's once again a transit-based strategy, but it has this green network which is the ecology and the recreation of the city, weaving through a series of districts and urban centers that are all tied together. And in these green ways, we have solar technologies and we have water recycling systems and we have uh, uh, recreation and these are community gardens this area here. Um, so this particular technology, very low, uh, which are just um, uh, black bottom, uh, very shallow ponds of water, which of course collect heat just like a solar collector. This is the core of Amman, the old sun, the plant, uh, and a beautiful place and a great picture. Um, and it's very hilly, wonderful uh, city. It's a light rail line. It was the old Wadi, the old image, which long since been filled, um, is the downtown, it's a historic area, the civic area, new mixed use and new development area out here, government. And then this urban strip, the dramatic name for a project that we've been working on. This is the palace grounds. This is the um, citadel and the uh, historic Roman amphitheater, circa AD 32. John, just go away. Forget it. I'm not trying to. Um, and this is the old. Uh, this is the old. This is too. This sub is too cool. I mean, look at that. I mean, wh what an amazing opportunity. So our design here. Did I? Yeah, it's a rolling three minutes. Anyway, this is a very interesting project. 
partly because of the transit and how excited. They only have buses now in Amman, and they're very excited to get their first fixed rail, and it really goes through the heart of it. And what it is is this necklace, Aiden, can this one? This is really kind of cool. This one didn't, this is not going to happen, but it was, uh, I was invited to do a kind of design thinking thing. In, in Rotterdam, they're expanding out into their historic ag land, and they're asking the question, well, the dairy and all the farming on the islands around is dying because, of course, the EU um, it creates more competition. This is all dyke land. Historically, it was very much uh, a wet, so the, and the, actually the whole island, that's the only part that really is above sea level. And so it naturally should be wetlands, uh, and yet they've been uh, raising cattle on it, which is kind of absurd. Really environmentally inappropriate, but it's, you know, Danish cheese, what can you say? You've got to have it. Um, so uh, they thought, well, maybe we can save these farms by doing ecotourism, which I thought was a joke, but it turns out it's actually a real thing. Throughout Europe, if you want to take a cheap vacation, you go and stay in the country at somebody's farm. Uh, and so this is actually a real, I thought this was a photo simulation, but, but it's not. So, you know, human beings are just so strange. I mean, they get away with anything. If they can do that, you know, we should be able to do a lot of really crazy stuff. So our approach to suburban growth in, in Rotterdam was rather than to spread out into the farmlands, which many were proposing, was to actually return a lot of the farmlands to wetlands and ca carve these streams and waterways through it and then consolidate the growth in the urban areas. And, uh, you know, there was a big thing of uh, uh, in the newspaper in Holland of, you know, American claims that we have to tear down the uh, dikes. No, no. This is it. This is the last okay. one. But I do, if you want well, to, you can. Off the stage, John. No, I'm not moving. I'm anyway. So the idea was that we uh, we, we were going to carve these wetlands through the island, return the island to its natural state. But these villages that were on the farming villages would run environment. They really could be great tourist spots. So a village that looked like that becomes like this, complete with houseboats because I used to live on one, fish farms, and all sorts of wetlands recycling and cool biological uh, framework. It turns out that what you, what you naturally can produce there is uh, shrimp and fish, water-based. Aquaculture is what makes sense in an aquatic environment. It does take a scientist to figure that out. Um, it takes an urbanist. Um, and so there we are. Envision Central Texas, we don't get to, after all. 